What was the first video game that made you realize you were a gamer? We all create our own personal biases on art and entertainment from our experiences pretty much early on as kids before broadening our horizons as we expand our personal tastes while making our own critiques and opinions as to what is and what isn't great art. Of course, part of the time we can be guilty of letting too much of our biases interfere with our attempts with trying to be objective about the media and entertainment we grew up with. For example, a person who grew up listening to 90s hip hop music may not be aware of the different sub genres of rock music existing during that decade and thus based the negative opinion of rock music as a whole on new metal bands. Most of these bands fronted by white men appropriating the mostly black-led hip-hop culture while being unaware of the indie rock scene. An art critic who is fascinated by the watercolor works of Monet might be appalled by the street art inspired works of the late Jean-Michel Basquiat and dismiss these paintings while ignoring the social and political commentary they were making about race and class. Critiquing art is not simply a matter of giving a general yay or nay about a book, film, record, or video game, but the act of analyzing, deconstructing, and trying to read into the subtext of any work of art is itself a political act, because ultimately, everything is political, one way or another. Therefore, being 100% objective about the critique of any art while ignoring our past experiences and personal biases and grunges is almost impossible. The economical, political, societal, and personal factors and experience come barging into your mind when you're trying to sit back and think about what worked and what didn't work about a piece of art, and trying to reconcile the hope for a more impartial way to view the entertainment you grew up with can be stressful, exhausting, maybe even painful since one might want to remember the positive experiences of watching a beloved childhood film and not think about the more, um, problematic elements of said film which might not make it hold up as well today. So, what does this little tangent about the relationship between the art we cherish and the many factors which take away being objective about our feelings about said art have to do with the classic 1997 Nintendo rail shooter video game Star Fox 64? Well, we're getting there, but first, full disclosure, and um, sorry to disappoint some of y'all in the audience, and sorry for most of y'all if this is a giant curveball this early in the video, but despite my channel profile picture, I am, in fact, not a furry. <laughs> Uh, the reason my picture is like this is because Golden Retrievers are my favorite breed of dog, and I'm not very good at picking out a unique profile picture. So, I just settled with this, and also filtered it through an AI engine to give it a synthwave look. No disrespect to any furries out there. Uh, apologies to those who spent $12,000 buying a full-body Fox McCloud suit, or a $50,000 Falco fur suit, and thought I was their comrade in fur. But seriously, this time, full disclosure... Again. Ah! Looks like we've got company. I've talked about my gaming background before in one version or another, but the Super Mario Bros. series was the first video game series I was introduced to, with my first video game being Super Mario Land on the Game Boy when I was a toddler in a playpen and I obviously couldn't beat the game back then, and so because the Game Boy didn't really pique my interest, I based most of my childhood gaming on early PC gaming, playing shooters and sports games. And so my elementary years were spent moving back and forth between playing Doom and Wolfenstein on the PC, and then some console gaming here and there, specifically the Super Nintendo and Sega Saturn, the latter which I'll stand by as an underappreciated console despite being a part of Sega's fading relevancy in the late 90s. <laughs> There's one down! As a kid, I had plenty of games to play on both consoles for hours, but rarely would I ever try to beat a game and then replay after beating it, treating the act of video gaming as if I were skimming a book, which I couldn't care less about all the subtle details, the character relationships, and inner feelings, and the overall descriptive settings novelists would describe. <laughs> 
there's one more to go. Which admittedly, I feel might be disrespectful to the authors who put out such works. And while there were titles which stuck out to me and still do years later, there wasn't a title which I fell in love with and for which I would try to beat again, again, and again. I guess you're good for something. But then, a few years later, there was Star Fox. Uh, 64, not the original Super Nintendo one, or its until recently unreleased sequel. Star Fox 64, which more or less reboots its Super Nintendo predecessor as well as borrow elements from the abandoned SNES sequel, falls the mercenary team called, well, Star Fox, consisting of leader, playable character, and probably the most popular fictional Irish fox in history, Fox McCloud. Yeah, get it? Because there's a Mick there, therefore he's an Irish space fox. There's also OG Star Fox team member Peppy Hare, Italian blue feathered stallion wig man and best pilot on the team Falco Lombardi, and Slip and Slippy Toe, the brains of the team, but flight skills, well... Ah! Slippy, get back here! Whoa! Help me! Whoa! Oh! Contracted by the Cornarian Army, headed by General Pepper to take out former mad scientist turned giant Galactus size head and hands Andros and his vast army of space apes, Star Fox flies and travels through a variety of planets, stars, and nebulae, engaging in space combat and showing the monkeys who's boss. <laughs> It's a game which, objectively in terms of its place in gaming history, stands alongside several N64 titles like The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, and Super Mario 64 as not only progressing the evolution of 3D console gaming, but especially in the case with Star Fox 64, with its various levels, amounts of combat, mechanics, and its, for its console, almost seamless frame rate, minus that one underwater level, might be alone in being the truly perfect and arguably the greatest title the N64 console had to offer, at least for its genre and series. Then again, if you played this game at least 200 times, yes, really 200 times, most of them in the hard route, but we'll get there, you too would be inclined to put your most played title at least somewhere in your top three games of any console. Speaking of which... <laughs> Adventure. No matter where you want to go, the possibilities are endless with Nintendo 64. The arrival of the Nintendo 64 console, or the N64 for short, in addition to the Sega Saturn and Sony's PlayStation 1, meant that 3D gaming was the norm. In the case of Sega and Sony, they were lucky to be ahead of the curve, but in the case of Nintendo, while the N64 was no doubt a landmark achievement for 3D gaming development, there was some catching up to do. In 1993, the original Star Fox was released on the Super Nintendo console, to critical and commercial success, selling 4 million copies and signaling the arrival of a new Nintendo franchise to join alongside Zelda and Mario. The original SNES game was groundbreaking and transformative, utilizing the Super FX graphics chip to make the game the first Nintendo game to use polygonal graphics, thanks in large part due to the collaboration between Nintendo and British game developer Argonaut Software, which was responsible for Nintendo's first 3D video game released just a year before on the Game Boy X. With the critical and commercial success of the first game, and a blueprint for how to progress further with world building and game development, Nintendo was ready to push for a sequel. This game, which would be called Star Fox 2, depicted the return of Andros and his army sending another attack towards the Lilat system, and honing in a target towards Corneria. Hence the primary target, besides staying alive with your wingman, would be to protect Corneria at all costs and not let the planet reach 100% damage, or else the game ends. 
you can see while playing that the seeds for Star Fox 64 were being planted with the introduction of the rival mercenary team Star Wolf, along with new team members for the Star Fox team, Faye and Mayu, who unfortunately, despite being the first female members of the team, were not in Star Fox 64, though the upcoming N64 game would feature Cat Monroe, a friend of Falco who we see in Zonus. Cat! As detailed in its Nintendo Life article, unfortunately the heads at Nintendo were concerned that its 16-bit appearance would look less modern than its 3D competitors, and despite the game being 95% completed, according to co-worker and British video game developer Dylan Cuthbert, rather than go ahead and release Star Fox 2, Nintendo chose to cancel the game and instead focus on a new Star Fox game for their new upcoming N64 console, though after years being stuck in limbo in Nintendo's archives, Star Fox 2 would see the light of day on the Super Nintendo Classic in 2017, and can also be played today on Nintendo Switch Online. The Nintendo 64 console, named after its 64-bit CPU, was made available in June of 1996 in Japan, and in September of that same year in North America. To say that the N64 was revolutionary for the brand would be an understatement. Nearly 21 million consoles were released in North America, and over 5 million in Japan. Keep in mind, and this is a fact which blew my mind as I was looking up Nintendo's history, that there were only 388 games released for the Nintendo 64, which was in sharp contrast to the Super Nintendo's 1,755 games released for that console. This was because of Nintendo's strategy on focusing on the quality of the games rather than the quantity, and this strategy can be seen when you play shooters made for the N64 like Rare's GoldenEye 007 and the near-perfect masterpiece Perfect Dark, and of course, Star Fox 64. However, while the N64 was a landmark gaming console, it was also met with with substantial criticism around that time, mainly the decision to keep using cartilages as opposed to CD-ROMs, which would sort of change come 2001 with the release of Nintendo's GameCube. But if you were familiar with playing the SNES, this was manageable if you didn't mind having to blow into cartilages every time you picked up a game. Yet, this is one example of Nintendo, unlike its current competitors Microsoft and Sony with their Xbox and PlayStation consoles respectively, having to play catch up and still lag behind. That doesn't mean that every game released on the N64 and every port to the console was a complete disaster, but the differences between the consoles at the time were quite noticeable. We'll come back to this point when we talk about the flaws and voiceover work for Star Fox 64. But to put it bluntly, and to use just one example from another gaming franchise, there's a reason why fans of the Mortal Kombat series prefer playing Mortal Kombat Trilogy on the PS1 as opposed to the N64 which was the first Mortal Kombat game I invested time in beating, and even then I couldn't help but notice the compressed audio and the inability to play four boss characters who were available on the PS1 roster. To quote one reviewer from way back, great first and second party games, but nearly non-existent third party support. And even now, while I will stand for the Nintendo Switch as being a pretty convenient console for sitting on the couch to kill time and to carry around, and one in which ports third-party games just fine, yeah, me being a snob, while I don't mind playing The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom on the Switch, despite there being existing emulators for Microsoft PCs which can port an existing copy of your Zelda games and make it so they can run 60 frames per second compared to the 30 frames per second on the Switch, when it comes to saying Say Bioshock though, a Mac or PC which runs at 60 frames per second, along with a keyboard and mouse is preferable to me. So, going back to talking about the series of discussion for this video, while I can't simply ignore the legacy that the original Star Fox game had as a step towards what I would consider to be the definitive Star Fox title in the series, and arguably one of the greatest games of all time in its own right, the SNES Star Fox also shows itself, pretty obvious at times, as being a product of its time. For one thing, and this will probably come up again here and there, the game shares the same basic plot as Star Fox 64, Antros 
Miles invades the Lilight system, declares war, wants to take over the Lilight system, and rather than hire batches of armies, General Pepper of the Cornarian Army hires the Star Fox mercenary team to take out Andros. In itself, this really isn't a problem, especially if we are talking about a flagship Nintendo property. Countless Zelda games have Link trying to stop Ganon, sometimes stopping him from obtaining the Triforce. Mario has to save Princess Peach, or Luigi, from Bowser, and Fox McCloud has to lead the Star Fox team to stop Andros from sucking in and spinning out the bits and pieces of the Lilat system. But, when we're talking about main characters being part of a mercenary team and doing missions in space, you'd think there would be even more threats in the broader universe beyond the Lilat system, but we'll come back to this. Also, and this is beating an already beaten, run over, and rotten forever dead horse, but the frame rate of the original game is not good. Part of the appeal of playing the original Star Fox, in contrast to the more combat-heavy, dialogue-filled Star Fox 64, is that the original Star Fox is a far more flight-skilled intensive game, and this becomes clear when you're playing the first level on Corneria with that booming, pounding song in the background as you're doing some pretty smooth flying as Fox. But the movement of the ship is off-putting, and while there are mods out there which correct the frame rate to make gameplay smoother, it's not like it fixes all the clunky details. Regardless, the first time I was playing the original, I wasn't sure if I was playing a game with anthropomorphic characters or the closest thing to a Top Gun game. Yet when you play the Corneria level on the N64 and compare it to the original, you'll notice, apart from the improved and smoother frame rate, Nintendo had a lot more time to detail and space out Corneria City. Buildings, bridges, even the O-shaped rock structures you fly through to help unlock the actual boss of the level, as long as Falco is alive. Obviously, the passing years of evolving technology would benefit the development team, but these differences make me want to not revisit and repeat playing the original game. Like, compare the frame rate experience of playing Star Fox on the SNES to, say, playing A Link to the Past or Donkey Kong Country. In fact, I would equate the gaming experience of playing the original Star Fox to trying to figure out how the hell to play the original System Shock on modern PCs for the first time, another influential game which came out directly after Doom and brought some innovation as far as inventory management and having the hacker and System Shock be able to jump on like Doom Guy. But the interface and graphics are just a tad too clunky, not impossible to beat, but frustrating to work the mechanics for the first time, especially if you're playing this after the superior System Shock 2. However, while I wouldn't play the original Star Fox for pleasure, replaying the unreleased second game on the SNES Classic, though the frame rate is still not remarkable despite the upgraded Super FX Chip. The best compliment I could say is that, unlike Star Fox 1 and Star Fox 64, this game was at least trying to do something a little different. Instead of the typical routes to get to Venom than the original N64 had, Corneria would be victim of a gradual assault if the player couldn't top Andross's forces. The all-range mode setting for combat, which allowed the player to fly freely off the rails, so to speak, would be a staple for Star Fox gameplay come the very next game, and in the instance of Star Fox Fox 2, the player would have to keep their eye on the target, especially during the times you would have to face the members of Star Wolf, just what the player needed to see. So, for retro gamers watching this, it might seem odd that this essay is making the case for the N64 version of Star Fox being not only the best in the Star Fox series, but also the best game on the Nintendo 64 console, since most gamers, at least those who try to make top 10 lists for greatest N64 games, will almost certainly put Ocarina of Time, Super Mario 64, and or GoldenEye 007 right on top of any list, which is understandable since the first 3D titles for Zelda and Mario were always going to be revolutionary for game development, regardless of any technological faults in comparison to, say, Breath of the Wild or Super Mario Wonder or Galaxy. And while I can understand Ocarina or Super Mario 64 being number one on any top 10 N64 list, or for that matter, all-time greatest games list, it's important to weigh the praise to these games with their fault, especially when compared to the rest of their respective series. Specifically, Ocarina playing out, for the most part, as a linear game with a little less freedom than Breath of the Wild or even the original OG Zelda, let alone Ocarina's frame rate being a bit of a problem for the N64, especially in comparison to Super Mario 64, which broke a lot of tradition for the Mario series as far as how you go about collecting stars to unlock doors and when it was just right to beat Bowser. But let's be honest, once you figure out how to beat Bowser and achieve at least 70 stars, the game becomes a bit of a breeze and there really is not much to do once Bowser is done 
problem with. Yet still, I can make a case that either of those games could be the best game on the N64. And I can also think of one other N64 game, which I could attempt to make a case is just perfect for the console, and which outtrumps a number of its rivals and other games with its own brand of juvenile humor and gameplay that rivals Super Mario 64, but that would be a whole nother video essay. Oh. So for now, in my humble opinion, and based on my gaming experience, Star Fox 64 is the flagship Nintendo 64 title which sticks out as being the most complete gaming experience. Why I think this is the case will be outlined deeper in the next few chapters, specifically on its storytelling, its rewardable playability, and its various levels. But at its core, Star Fox 64, like Super Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time, was the best kind of game made for 90s kids, not simply because of the game's rating or the mechanics with the N64 controller, which added buttons allowing players to multitask as they went through each level on the rail course in the all-range mode, but again, the completeness of the game came from Nintendo throwing it all on the table. There are ideas which carried over from the unreleased Star Fox 2, the influences from other media which was a part of the original Star Fox, and most importantly, just how self-contained the story in Star Fox 64 is, especially if you're playing the hard route. And Star Fox 64 is the example I go to when I explain how the N64 became the first game console where I really got how to beat video games, achieve all 120 stars in Super Mario 64 at least once, Check. Play my way through GoldenEye 007 a few dozen times? Check. And then, there was Star Fox 64, which again, I shit you not, I beat at least 200 times. Well, full disclosure, again and again, part of the reason I beat the game that many times was because I was told by a friend that if I beat the game a certain amount of times, there would be a reward at the end of my journey. And me being the naive youngling almost two decades ago, of course I spent hours trying to score metal on aquas by getting a certain amount of enemy kills, despite its slow frame rate. Find a way to not get the Great Fox hit by any missile at Sector Z so I don't have to get the bad ending of the game, and especially coasting and shooting through Area 6, more on that later. The irony though is that there were secrets you could achieve if you got all of the medals on each level. That is, unlocking the more difficult Expert Mode, which comes with a nice pair of aviators for Fox's avatar during gameplay, but my friend didn't know this at the time, which I guess means the joke's on him. So now let's talk about the game's two selling points which make it hold up today, the gameplay and the density of its story and world building. Oh, and just a heads up, and this goes without saying, there will be spoilers for Star Fox 64 throughout this video. The Star Fox series isn't known for being exceedingly difficult once you know the basics, and while some gamers might have to go through a learning curve to get used to one level or another, the rest is easy to understand so long as you ride along for the action, and it's the action that sells Star Fox 64 as the best among the series. Here, the gameplay is simple. I mean, really, really simple. Shoot to kill, protect your teammates from dying, and terminate Andros with extreme prejudice. So easy, even a 5 year old would understand. Hence the game's KA rating. Of course the gameplay is much more than that description. The various power-ups around each level can heal you like silver rings, gold rings to give you the ability to boost up your health meter, get extra lives, and the ability to upgrade your r wing lasers, as well as bombs, which yes, like the man said, USE BOMBS WISELY! The r wing is what you'll be riding in for most of the game, mainly on a rail course where you ride along one way without much freedom. All range mode, however, is where your flight skills come in handy. In particular, levels such as Sector Z, the easy boss fight on on Corneria, Ficina, Katina, and the Star Wolf fight on Venom before the good ending. All those barrel rolls and somersaults and boosts Peppy has been teaching you were just warming you up for when you get to fly freely in one area, and you will have to make U-turns in case you go off course or miss any enemies. For most of the game, the R-Wing will be your main ride, but besides the R-Wing, the Landmaster is a tank that sorta operates like an R-Wing on the ground, except it can't fly apart from being able to hover for a bit. You'll be riding this thing on Macbeth and Titania. 
the Star Fox submarine, uh, called the Blue Marine, aka almost the Beatles reference just to color off, is exclusively used on the underwater level Aquas. And by the way, the game's cover promotion of the N64 Rumble Pack was my first experience where the game really took you along for the ride, as you felt every crash and every shake while completing a mission, and even now with a Switch controller while playing the game through Nintendo Switch Online. I can't help but feel tension if I'm a few inches too close to debris on Sector X and my controller controller shakes my hands, unsure sometimes if it's because of fear or because I took a hit. If you achieve a certain amount of kills on a given level, the game rewards you with a medal for that level, and achieving all 15 medals for all 15 levels will unlock the more difficult expert mode, where your R wing is more vulnerable to attacks and if your wing gets hit once on an object or building, you automatically lose that wing. However, trying to score your way to mastering Star Fox 64 means realizing that you're not flying solo. Each of your three team members assists you in their own way. Peppy helps you learn your flight skills, and he provides you knowledge on how to beat each boss. Falco, being your best friend, is cocky, but he's also the best pilot and can help shoot down enemies when necessary. And while Slippy is clearly just an average pilot at best, and definitely not the best runner seeing as how he can't even keep up with the much older Peppy at the end credits, he does provide you with each boss's energy shield, aka their health. Keeping your team alive and keeping that thumb pressing on the A button to shoot guarantees you a chance to reach a high score if the number in the top left corner goes red. But if one teammate is down, not only do you lose an advantage in beating a level like Corneria or Sector Y, you also get penalized in your final score, so keeping them alive becomes a necessity when you try and beat your previous score. Speaking of which, one of the major selling points of the game, along with the 1993 original, is that it rewards the gamer with its replayability, resembling arcade game playing as you push on that A button and rank in medals before chalking up your highest final score, making you want to put more metaphorical coins into the machine, so to speak. To put it one way, if you're a noob gamer and you're just navigating through Star Fox 64 the first time, chances are you're just trying to get to Venom as soon as possible. Hence the easy route consisting of Corneria, Meteo, Fishina, Sector X, Titania, Boise, and Venom will be the one you'll play through. And full disclosure once again, this was also the first route I went through as a kid. And it's also a route where you'll probably get one of your lower final scores, so you're better off trying to go through more medium or hard levels to rake in a higher score tally. Of course, being the easiest of the 25 possible routes you might go through, you may be surprised that once the credits finish rolling and before you put in your initials to rank your score, you'll be greeted by a Faden of the head of a laughing Andros, when you realize that the Andros you beat after going through Boise and then to Venom was robotic and not the real nightmare-fueled horror you face if you want the good ending. Of course, the fact that you have 25 ways to beat this game speaks to the incredible variety of levels you will be flying or driving around, as every level and mission carries its own little story within a larger story, which is a good segue into discussing how Star Fox 64 is more than just a game. Not every video game needs an overly complicated story to make it an all-time great game, because even a simple game can say so much about us, society and life without even trying to, and even newer or updated games in an existing series can create a new peak for storytelling combined with innovations in gaming development. In terms of the Nintendo 64 console, Super Mario 64 was an expansion of an already existing formula for Mario games, albeit building up on an already outdated one in which you are saving a damsel in distress from Bowser. Ocarina of Time expanded the lore of Zelda games by introducing time travel for the first 3D Zelda game, all while maintaining the basic goal of stopping Ganondorf, aka Ganon, from stealing the Triforce and saving a damsel in distress despite Zelda having a little more personality and agency. The Star Fox games hardly have any damsels, unless you consider Slip and Slippy a damsel in distress because he got a little too curious and got stuck on Titania. Speaking of which, we can now discuss what I touched on in the last paragraph of the last chapter discussing the game's missions and the worlds they take place in. The world building in Star Fox 64 is criminally underrated as far as looking back at 90s gaming and the 
variety with each level extended beyond the difficulty. For example, for some reason I have no idea why Corneria is called the fourth planet of the Lilac system, as stated in the opening narration of the main game, whether it's to signify it's the capital of the system or the most habitable planet, but just by playing the mission and riding along until we get to either boss of the level, we can see that the war declared by Andros will risk the lives of the civilian population, and his attempted takeover threatens to destroy the entirety of Corneria City, with buildings threatening to fall right on top of you if you fly low and enemy ships shooting you down, giving you a taste for what's to come later. Calling in the military is one thing, but for General Pepper of the Cornarian army, why risk the lives of your men when you can send in mercenaries trained to do the job of stopping Andros instead? Why have men die for a war when 99% of the time, four mercenaries can sleep, eat, fly around, and go home to bed? At least if the player is good enough. That's where Star Fox comes in. Speaking about other planets now, Fishinna is a wintry planet where its military base has an enemy bomb planted, and it's here where you'll likely come across the rival mercenary Starwolf team for the first time, them being contracted by Andros to take you down, and just like with Star Fox, each of the members is unique beyond being assigned one person to shoot down. Maybe it's because I'm used to watching the fan-made YouTube series of Fox in Space and really dig hearing Wolf with that southern accent. Well, if it isn't Fox McCloud. Can't let you do that, Star Fox. People want to know the secret to Wolf O'Donnell's ability to pick up all these beautiful women. You'll be seeing your dad soon, Fox. I'm sorry. I thought I heard you say something vaguely decipherable, but I'm not sure. No way! I don't believe it! Way out west, there was this fella, this Lebowski. He called himself the Dude. But I don't really think the James Bond villain approach with Wolf O'Donnell and a sort of English accent is quite apt, at least in the sense that the Star Fox series is influenced heavily by one particular sci-fi franchise that itself borrows from westerns, but more on that later. While the Great Leon has been depicted elsewhere as over the top, you get the sense that the lizard pilot is the best of the team, which makes sense given that he has to shoot down that annoying bird Falco. Nepple baby Andros' nephew Andrew is kind of a joke character, and predictably he's assigned to take down Slip and Slippy. And then there's Pigma Dangbar, the literal and symbolic pig of the Star Wolf team, an ex-member of Star Fox. There have been some truly awful, immoral characters in gaming history, mostly relegated to more mature games, but Pigma Dagmar might be one of the most despicable, truly evil characters in gaming. What with that weaselly voice bragging how he'll do his old pal Peppy fast, or when he gloats to Fox about the death of his father, which while other characters do, none with as much glee and delight as this swine. Besides riding a long rail shooting, Star Fox 64 is able to tell each of the individual 15 subplots in each location by assigning you to do one task or another, and this is where environmental storytelling Telling separates Star Fox from, say, the 15 main levels in Super Mario 64, Corneria teaches you to keep your team alive, in particular Falco. Vishina and the good Venom mission have you try and take down Star Wolf with their basic or updated ships, respectively, and Katina being an obvious nod to the 1996 blockbuster film Independence Day, and uh, we won't even talk about the video game adaptation here, which is uh, something alright, is where you have to destroy the hovering mothership. The underrated mission on Macbeth is the best of the two Landmaster missions, sorry Titania, where the game becomes a train heist of sorts and provides humor with its train conductor boss. Aquas and Zonus on the hard route are sites of pollution thanks to Andros and the war, with the latter level featuring security lights which might spot you. Solar is a literal sun, aka a star, aka the center of the Lilat system, meaning you and your team's ships are at risk of taking significant damage unless you're able to heal your team with just enough kills, though you should try to avoid if you want to maintain a high score. And of course, Venom bearing the name, well, Venom, it's only right that the name suggests a rather toxic planet, where the mad scientist Andros experimented on himself, which explains, well, this. 
But it isn't just planets you'll be dealing with. Meteo is filled with incoming asteroids floating and ready to do more than dent your R wing. Sectors X and Y take you to space where each nebula shows the damage caused by the fighting between the Cornarian and Venom forces. And if you're paying enough attention on Meteo and Sector X, you might unlock a secret warp route where you'll go into hyperspeed and be sent to a nicely detailed section of the level with some of the best art direction in the game, at least for Nintendo 64 games. Sector Z, on the other hand, is a purely all-range mode mission, and the Star Fox team ships are not the only ships in danger. The Great Fox carrier ship is threatened by the launch of six missiles, which, if one hits, takes you to the very lame, lame, lame Boise space station and very basic bad ending. So if you're doing the all-hard route, you're better off going all-in and shooting each missile, all while keeping your team alive in preparation for the very next levels. Anyway, the difficulty in writing and editing a retrospective or analysis on any particular game is balancing out how you, as a gamer, work as a modern gamer now versus a retro gamer playing retro devices or looking back on your past playing experiences, and how today you are able to see what makes a game click and what doesn't. Readers in high school or college don't spend time in English classes reading, say, The Catcher in the Rye, The Great Gatsby, A Farewell to Arms, or any work of Shakespeare because modern literature is in a rot or that they're intrinsically better than books released in the latter half of the 20th century to today, or just simply to compare each writer's writing style. We read classic works to know what makes a story click, how a novelist can piece together the plot and make the tiny pieces that make a three-act structure into a coherent work, and how they carefully craft and detail the setting, location, and character personalities and traits, and I feel that sometimes, when we're running in circles around the endless debate over whether video games qualify as art, we neglect the relationship between video games and literature, and how video games can put together all the pieces that make a novel into a visual marvel that's worth revisiting. What's he saying? But wait, you might ask, are you saying Star Fox 64 is literature? That we should play this space shooter as if we were reading a book? No wonder you're using all this big talk you big armchair brain you. Well, aren't you just another pretentious YouTuber, you little Einstein? Well, yeah, admittedly, I am in fact another pretentious internet know-it-all asshole with a YouTube channel. But at least I'm honest about it. But no, to be clear as to what I'm arguing here, Star Fox 64 is not like a novel. So what kind of literature is Star Fox 64? Well, a screenplay for a film, a Hollywood script for a film, but not just any film, an action flick. And what is the cinematic template for this game? Star Wars. It's just a perfect point of reference and comparison. I mean, is it really a coincidence that the name for the series in other countries is Lilat Wars? Which, if you just switch around the two different titles by eliminating and come up with one brand new title, you get Lilat Fox? I mean, it's not technically wrong. Fox McCloud is, in fact, an anthropomorphic fox who lives in the Lilat system, but Tangent aside, if one were to read up the fourth draft of episode 4 New Hope from Star Wars as written by George Lucas and just skim some paragraphs, a gamer might realize after thinking it over that Star Fox 64 feels like a video game successor to A New Hope, and not simply because the writing team behind the game was able to write such fantastic lines, creating arguably one of the most quotable video games in history. There's also a detailed description of the desert planet Tatooine and the Empire enemy. Death Star in the New Hope script, which is carried over in the subsequent films when describing other planets in the Star Wars universe. But as far as how Star Fox 64 utilizes this, each planet, star, and nebula really is its own unique location and has its own distinct environment. Not only that, but the script and Star Fox 64 outline each character. And as Lucas describes Luke Skywalker, Fox McCloud is a team leader and someone with heroic aspirations. Just like Skywalker and in later Star Wars related media, Fox McCloud struggles trying to live up to the shadow of his father James McCloud, his whereabouts almost unknown despite being presumed dead, and whom Fox never brings up at all, not even as a way to boast to his enemies, or probably because the tragedy is too much for him. 
Nevertheless, as his very first line of dialogue is spoken by voice actor Mike West before the first mission on Corneria, he is confident and courageous, and also caring for the other three members of his team. Star Fox 64 being a video game means that the game's story and plot don't necessarily follow a traditional three-act structure, nor does Fox McCloud follow a set-in-stone hero's journey, unlike Link in several Legend of Zelda video games. Nevertheless, as his elder mentor and teammate Peppy compliments him, Fox leads the team and flies like his father, with him becoming a better pilot, and while the game never shows how Fox feels about about the loss of his father, we see for ourselves through playing that all the young Fox McCloud needs to do is follow his own course, even while following his father's example of leadership. Which is why the good Venom level and game ending creates such a fantastic, emotional, and satisfactory conclusion to the game's story, as opposed to the fake-out bad ending with the robotic Andross. After going alone to take on Andross and after you've defeated the absolutely terrifying nightmare that is the true form of Andross, Along with his creepy floating brain and eyes, the game flashes bright white light, making the gamer think that Fox McCloud will surely meet his end. Until... Don't ever give up, my son. Father? Whether this is a ghost or a spirit from another dimension, a result of Andross's experiments, or if this is part of Fox's subconsciousness telling him to wake up and stay alive, James McCloud guides his son out of the Venom base. I know I get a tingle down to my stomach when I hear the line again and again. Never give up. Trust your instincts. And it is here that I want to touch on a line of dialogue that was often brought up by Fox's teammate Peppy. Throughout the game's story and on several levels, Peppy Hare encourages you as Fox to keep going by saying, Never give up! Trust your instincts! It's a line of dialogue which, just like any of Peppy's lines, bringing up James to Fox, gets repeated, and you don't think too much about it as you are playing the game. That is, until you realize, while playing the game's good ending, that this exact line of dialogue just so happens to be the second-to-last line of dialogue that James says to his son Fox before exiting the Venom base. And thus, this game goes full circle on Fox's arc becoming his own unique hero in this particular Nintendo series. Fox coming out of the base's tunnel while it burns in flames, all while he struggles from Corneria all the way to Venom to take on Andros once and for all, is his Luke destroys the Death Star by using the Force moment. It shows that Fox McCloud never needed to live up to the talents and expectations of his father and try to emulate his dad's flight skills. Instead, he had to be his own man his own pilot, his own leader, and as Fox meets back with his team in space, him looking over the stars to see if he can find his father anywhere above, and Peppy asking, What's wrong, Fox? Nothing. Nothing's wrong. He, and the gaming audience, realized that Fox never really needed his father to hold his hand, so to speak. That he never needed his dad to help him ride a bike without trading wheels, or in this case, handle an R-wing in space. That as long as he trusts his instincts and never gave up, he could achieve anything, even with the help of his teammate and friends. Closing out Star Fox 64 on such a fantastic high note. So, that's how the base game ends, putting aside your inevitable replays to outdo your own scores, but there's also other small little details you might have missed. Obviously, the R-Wings are inspired by the X-Wings in Star Wars, along with the references to other media like Independence Day and the Beatles thrown in there, but as far as story goes, the only major comment against what I'm trying to say and what I can think of is that while the player as Fox drives the plot of the story, however they choose to go about finishing all the way to Venom, as I said, earlier, Star Fox 64 doesn't have a set-in-stone three-act structure, unless you consider Slippy getting captured in Titania or the Great Fox getting hit by a missile to be the midpoint of the story, depending on your route. Though, in the case of following all the levels on the hard route, there really isn't a midpoint since the Great Fox never gets hit. Nevertheless, the way the gamer retells the story of Star Fox 64, like a group of kids gathering around a campfire to hear their own versions of scary stories, there is a clear start and end point, and whatever is left in the middle depends on how you, the gamer, choose to tell the story by playing as Fox McCloud. This alone, in my opinion, makes Star Fox 64 such a perfect gaming experience for gamers old and new. 
And about that word perfect, with regard to how we as gamers and or critics define what a perfect game is, what qualifies as a perfect video game is really a matter of its technological, gameplay and storytelling qualities, its gameplay mechanics and whether or not future ports could make gameplay easier, its place and time upon release if it was the start of a series or continuation, its respective console and how it handled the console's technology at the time, and whether or not it holds up, i.e if it's timeless. Some of these discussions on perfect art can also carry over into discussions on what makes a perfect film, book, painting, or record, but keeping the discussion on video games for a moment. Games which I consider to be perfect for their respective genre and console include System Shock 2 on the PC, Breath of the Wild on the Nintendo Switch, and MVP Baseball 2005 on the original Xbox, to name a few games in genre variety. While the debate over which N64 game is the greatest is probably already settled, usually with retrospective lists putting Ocarina of Time or Super Mario 64 on top of such lists, and Star Fox 64 somewhere in the top 10 of these lists, most of this list making runs the risk of conforming based on legacy, especially when we discuss the distinction between being the greatest game for the console versus being the most perfect to play for the console. And the period following the release of the N64 saw Nintendo and other game developers trying to work with a technology that was only going to evolve further with fantastic games like Banjo-Kazooie and Perfect Dark outdoing their respective genre predecessors in terms of perfect gameplay, them being Super Mario 64 and GoldenEye 007. Further, while Ocarina of Time certainly brought a punch to the Legend of Zelda franchise being the first Zelda game in 3D and especially on the story front, shockingly, when compared to how seamless Super Mario 64 runs even on the Switch port, Ocarina of Time's frame rate on the N64 is a track, though a pretty manageable one, and for which is made up by its other positive attributes, despite what I would consider the perfect and arguably greatest Zelda experience being released nearly two decades later, that being Breath of the Wild. See also Ocarina of Time's menu, which is a hassle trying to equip Link with items. However, Star Fox 64 is unique amongst these games, in that not only are the gameplay mechanics and maneuvers simple to pull off and understand, making for such a perfect gaming experience back in the 90s in terms of flight rail shooters and surpassing the original game's clunky graphics, but of course, the story and lore, as as simple as it's written, elevates the game in a way that not a lot of games back then could. A fantastic combination of perfect flight gameplay and a pretty great cinematic experience unique among N64 games, and putting Star Fox 64 above its predecessor in the series, and a combination of perfection and greatness which is missing from Ocarina and Super Mario 64. Finally, since this chapter delved into the cinematic qualities of the game, Star Fox 64 would not be the game that it is without its incredible voice acting with reportedly over 700 lines of dialogue spoken according to the now defunct official game website. I'll do my best. Andros won't have his way with me. I see him up ahead. Let's rock and roll. Things are starting to heat up. Quit thinking around, Clip. I admit defeat. Are you gonna listen to that monkey? Ha, you're not as stupid as you look! I can't believe I lost to this scum! Sorry to Jet, but I'm in a hurry. Let me handle this! Flippy, get back here! Flippy! We're always saving your hide, Flip. I'll go it alone from here. Hit me down! Wait, that was one of ours! Ha! You did it! That area's an oven! Only I have the brains to rule my life. So, Androd, you show your true form. Who are you guys? We're Star Fox! Do a barrel roll! Flippy's not such a screw up after all! Thanks a lot, Peppy. I'll take the sky any day. Sheesh, Falco. You too. Are you gonna hug all the fun? 
Cat, can't you go bother someone else? Beautiful. I could kiss you for that. We've got the bad guys on the run. Don't worry. Wendy's here. Say your prayers, Andros. What? It's time for us to go now. And despite the compressed audio that the voiceover was processed, hey, at the very least the game isn't doing the SNES audio for the characters like in the original. So let's give some credit to the voice actors. Mike West as Fox McCloud is truly remarkable. Although Fox's arc in the game doesn't necessarily follow a completely spelled out hero's journey, we can hear just from the voiceover work just how comfortable he is being the leader of the team. But we also see a side of him that speaks more about his character than we initially thought. Fox's reluctance to talk about his presumed dead father, despite reminders from his old teammate and friend Peppy just how much Fox is like James, is a contrast to Star Wolf teammate and Nepo monkey baby Andro, the nephew of Andros, in that despite his confidence in getting the job done, there is a side to him which is more humble and speaks a lot about his character. And sure, I know some gamers might think that the overly compressed audio makes them think that Fox has a speech impediment when he's in flight, something I'm pretty sure a Fox in space takes a poke at when hearing Fox talk. I know I feel self-assured that I'm going to do well every time he says, I'll do my best, Andros won't have his way with me, or when he says, we're gonna break through that fleet. The late Rick May as Peppy Hare, and as the game's main antagonist Andros, also deserves credit. May voices Peppy without a shred of irony that he's voicing an anthropomorphic rabbit who's an old-timer, and more of a no-bullshit military vet when he's telling Slip and Slippy to quit thinking around. And as Andros, even with voice modifications, we, the gaming audience, hear the cosmic horror, terror, and just how sinister he is before he shows his true form, though he doesn't have much of a Brooklyn accent despite the Italian last name, Bill Johns as Falco Lombardi displays all the arrogance, cockiness, and pride he has as the best pilot on the team, and Lissa Brown as Slippy Toad gives him the supporting role needed to complete the Star Fox team. What Slippy lacks in pilot skills, Brown makes it clear he makes up for in his technical and engineering skills. There are other voice actors who had noteworthy roles, but special credit must be given to Jaw Green, who does a handful of characters and bosses throughout the game. And when I say bosses, I mean a lot of the bosses. <laughs> Not just voicing Leon from the Star Wolf team, but he's able to make each of the bosses on Sector Y and Zonus his own. And of course, there's his voice as the train conductor on Macbeth. From being hilarious for the audience to hear such a specific southern accent, done right when he first says, Here come the little hyenas now! To his absolutely over-the-top death when you shoot the switches to get a mission accomplished on the level? No! Get the train! Okay, stop it! The voice acting just puts the cherry on top of the Star Fox 64 Sunday, putting it over the edge of Ocarina as Super Mario 64 as a perfect gaming experience. However, that use of the word perfect should always come with an asterisk, because oh boy, it's that time again. While admittedly, this video is a rather unnecessarily long fanboy rant about one of my favorite childhood games, it would be dishonest to say that Star Fox 64 is a completely perfect, untouchable classic, so let's break down the nitpicks and flaws for a brief moment. Although the game was one of the first examples to use voiceover dialogue for nearly the entirety of the game's length, a minor beef with gamers was the way the dialogue was mixed, specifically the compression. It's not a major issue since the dialogue is never incoherent and yeah I would say the compressed sound at times makes sense if Star Fox is in flight but in today's era the compressed voices sound a little too muffled especially when you compare them to the clean sounding uncompressed audio which was leaked onto the internet a few years ago I'll do my best Andros won't have his way with me I'll do my best Andros won't have his way with me. We're entering Corneria City now. We're entering Corneria City now. Why don't you come down here, Falco? Why don't you come down here, Falco? All aircraft report. All aircraft report. We're heading out. All aircraft report. We're heading out. All aircraft report. Ah! Ah! 
Also, and as mentioned before, while Aquas is unique in having Fox use the team's blue marine to take out the bioweapon during the hard route, this is where the frame rate of the game shows the N64's limitations, and the frame rate here somehow manages to be even worse than Ocarina of Times, at least for this one single mission. I mean, sure, Aquas is beatable and is easy if you accept being underwater is going to limit the rail shooting movement of the submarine in comparison to the R-Wing, but trying to navigate for the first time while taking out some of the sea enemies, all done while shooting missiles so you can see, and making players wonder why the Blue Marine doesn't come with decent headlights, makes the quality of gameplay take a brief nosedive. Though, to be fair on Nintendo's part, doing a whole level underwater and having to program and design the underwater combat must have been a giant hassle behind the scenes. And when comparing the N64 Aquas to the 3DS remake, sure it's brighter at the start and maybe that takes away from being forced to use missiles so you can see, and the movement of the marines all the same, but the frame rate's pretty manageable on the 3DS. The N64 version, however, is almost 95% dark all the way through. So, I don't want this next part to be an all-around political analysis of the game, but growing up and playing Star Fox 64 at least 200 times, once again, really 200 times, there really wasn't anything too deep or political about the game that could be worth contemplating for a kid like me. Come on, a kid like me would rather be playing backyard football than deal with whether or not racism towards the monkeys and other lightlight species is a thing in the lightlight system. Are you gonna listen to that monkey? I'm monkey food if I don't leave. Time to show the monkeys who's boss. Here comes a big one. However, reading the plain text of the video game now, and with new appreciation for its technological achievements, I wouldn't be inclined to say Star Fox is an outright jingoistic piece of military propaganda in the same league as Halo or the Department of Defense propaganda-filled Call of Duty games, but while the fact that General Pepper would rather call a mercenary team as opposed to training and sending mass amounts of troops into war might seem like an argument against overspending on military and rushing to train unexperienced soldiers into a a war they never wanted to be a part of, Star Fox 64 does subscribe to a pretty simple good versus evil binary, where the big Galactus monkey head has to be taken down by the good mercenary team while briefly dealing with a bad mercenary team at times. And yet, by looking at the raw bones state of Corneria, while I don't 100% know the politics of the Lilat system, and I'm not even going to try to teach a polyscience class on how Lilat works, it seems less like a pillar of freedom and more of a military state. Like, literally, during the very first mission on Corneria, there's posters of General Pepper on buildings all over when you get to Corneria City. So, okay, if Corneria is a military state with a general as its head, and if the Star Fox team is a private mercenary contract group, which is more effective at killing and minimizing civilian casualties, then what does that make Andros? Some kind of big-headed space communist or something? Or is the appropriate read that Andros is authoritarian right? Some might call these elements like the General Pepper fly and the military ceremony at the end of the game fascistic, but I don't think kids playing the game came out of it being simps for the military-industrial complex. And yeah, despite the coincidence that a currently sitting US Space Force General right now shares the very last name, Pepper, with the General Pepper of Corneria, the actual inspiration for Pepper was the Beatles album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I know I drew some positive parallels to A New Hope earlier, but reading the game now if I was reading it negatively, it would play out like a reverse version of Star Wars A New Hope, where instead of being part of a rebellion alliance against a powerful empire, you are, as Star Fox, a mercenary team, contracted by an imperialist militaristic empire to take out a threat which threatens said empire's interests, specifically financial. Then again, any over-analysis on my part would be useless because when we talk about Star Fox, we are talking about a game which was released and made long after the end of Imperial Japan. So, being being born in a country which was responsible for not one, but two awful nuclear strikes on Japan, yeah, not even gonna walk on those eggshells. Overall though, the potential political problems with Star Fox don't bother me because, while I can't simply ignore them, I think the gameplay and story make up for whatever problematic elements might come out of it. In fact, I equate this to having to reassess a game like StarCraft in light of its inferior sequel StarCraft 2, which seemed to reverse course the pessimistic feel of space combat and war 
war, and going against the original game's motto of the only allies are enemies, and hence, I think the fun outweighs the negative. However, the only major problem, which has dragged Star Fox 64's legacy, and for that matter, the entire series, is that the Star Fox series is a classic example of diminishing results. What I mean by saying this is that, unlike recent entries in The Legend of Zelda and Super Mario, there hasn't been a game in the Star Fox series that's reached the potential that this game, or for that matter, the original has. Yes, this includes the 3DS version as well, which bizarrely has new voiceover work, despite the game working with pretty much the same exact script and sound effects as the N64 version. And while Star Fox Zero looks like a polished modern version of its N64 predecessor, once again, the series just couldn't get over the hump of trying to bring something that stands out, and more or less played out as a rehash. And while the fan-made Star Fox Event Horizon game looks like another polished blueprint for a grander, more modern Star Fox game, with a lot more nuance with Andross and General Pepper that simply isn't a good versus bad story, it still can't help but stick to the same Lilat system and script, clearly wearing the Star Fox 64 influence on his sleeve. Oh, and we're not even gonna try and attempt to make the case whether or not Star Fox Adventures could really be considered a Star Fox game, given the reduction in flight combat. Apologies to Crystal fanboys. Yet, in the end, all of these little nitpicks and over, over, over analysis don't completely dent the entire product as a whole, because for one reason or another, even now, almost two decades later, I keep coming back to Star Fox 64 as a complete experience, an example of what the Nintendo 64 had to offer despite its limitations compared to the PS1. A game in which killing an hour or so doesn't feel like a waste of time, and trying to one-up yourself with your final score is worth it. Of course, moments like Fox following his father out of Andross's bunker, or the Macbeth train crash are moments you can replay and watch again and again, but I don't think they quite put the final nail in the coffin as to what makes the game stand out from other N64 games, because there would have to be at least one major factor. One aspect that makes this game go from a good time to simply legendary. If only there was that one level. Hmm. Came in here. No problem. Do you copy? Emergency maneuvers! Too late. Game over, pal. The second to final level before the good Venom Andross fight at ending, Area 6, is hands down the best level in Star Fox 64, and maybe one of the greatest levels in video games history. A perfect blend of script writing and dialogue, gameplay action, total pedal to the metal extreme panic tension, music, and absolute payoff towards the end. Ranking this level right up with some of the great individual video game levels such as Fort Frolic and Bioshock, City of Tears and Hollow Knight, and the many variations of Rainbow Road in the Mario Kart series. And for which separates Star Fox 64 from other N64 titles. Throughout the game, especially going through the hard route, the player gets accommodated to a variety of combat and flight action, whether it be avoiding being spotted by security lights on Zonus, trying to reach at least 100 kills at Sector Y in order to get to Aquas, and beating the clock to take down the six missiles at Sector Z. Hell, even some of the more medium route levels like Solar, Macbeth, or the basic bad Venom ending teach the player to consistently be in action and to grow a third eye. Area 6, however, combines a lot of what makes this game a repeatable play only on a more anxiety-filled manner, with various enemies constantly attacking you and your teammates, who you'll need to keep alive to maintain your score and to beat Star Wolf on Venom. More importantly, Area 6 is a level where you have to make some sacrifice to reach a high point score, mainly knowing when to take damage while shooting at enemies. You might be tempted to avoid most enemies the first time around and just get used to traveling through the level, but that's really the coward's way. You just gotta keep that finger on the A button on your controller at all times, and not take a hit while trying to shoot one of the top looking structures down, or trying to shoot down the missiles targeting you and your team. Overall, once you play through it a few times, you'll realize Area 6 gives you plenty of opportunities to boost up your score, especially if you save some bombs from playing Zonus, and the enemies are just plain relentless, even if the level's final boss, the Gorgon, is easy to destroy once you know how to beat it. Then again, the player deserves a bit of a breather after trying to reach 300 plus kills to get a medal. 
or maybe 500, or 600, or 692, seriously, what the fuck? Playing the level for the first time in over 20 years, I was thoroughly impressed with myself that I was able to reach at least 200 plus kills on the first try, let alone above 270. Maybe it was subconscious muscle memory that made me do better than I thought I would, but everything just felt like second nature. So much so that I just can't help but repeat this level again and again and again until I can reach 300 and get Area 6's medal. And then do 400 and then 500 and then some. Don't get too cocky, Star Fox. You also find, after a few playthroughs, there are a lot of little moments happening throughout the level and memorable quotes from even seemingly minor characters like Cayman and the Area 6 Commander, which makes this whole level fit together. And of course, there's the moment the team is joined by Rob and the Great Fox. We're gonna break through that fleet! They're through the second line! Great Fox will cover you. Fire! Fire! Don't let them through! Mmm. 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 Beautiful. If you're just playing through this game just one time and you play the Boise level over Area 6, you are seriously missing out on one of gaming's finest moments. <laughs> If you have watched any of my video essays discussing video games before, you know that I try and attempt to go beyond the symbol yay or nay as to whether or not a game holds up or not, and explore what games, like books, films, and records, say about us as individuals in our society. And while broader political and societal implications cannot be ignored, I try to focus first on the plain old gaming experience and explain and analyze how each game is able to balance its gameplay mechanics graphics, art direction, sound design, storytelling, and character development, even if a game may not be saying anything too deep. However, I am also guilty of not being 100% truly objective, and I simply cannot be objective about my love and appreciation for Star Fox 64, as it is a game I used to spend hours beating and beating again and again, and today, I don't mind killing an hour playing just to beat my highest score. It's simply amazing and a matter of time that Star Fox 64 is a video game that holds up incredibly well, in comparison to Nintendo's other franchise titles released on the N64 as well as being the best in a series which, unfortunately, has had an uneven track record in the years following Star Fox 64's release. Through its combination of storytelling, voice acting, action, soundtrack, combat variation, and emotional feelings, especially if you get the good ending, it is one of the earliest examples in video game history in which a video game can come close to feeling like you're strapped to your seat in a film theater, anticipating the final climactic showdown in a sci-fi action thriller. Sure, the adult in me can appreciate the many qualities an old retro game has and how it works well today, but a game like Star Fox 64 speaks not to my present day adult trying to get by in a cold unfeeling world, but to my inner child. That visceral feeling, that moment when you feel like a kid picking up a controller in front of a TV yet again, sitting for hours trying to go over the hill, never giving up, and trusting your instincts is what makes video games truly special. Thanks for watching everyone. If you enjoyed this video essay, please comment and like. If you want to see more video essays, please consider subscribing to the Armchair Brain YouTube channel and ring the bell as well to watch discussions on topics in philosophy, art, politics, and video games. Also, please subscribe to my Twitch streaming channel at twitch.tv slash armchairbrain to watch me play video games and occasionally discuss other topics for future video essays.